And when it became clear that actually the, you couldn't from the outset say that the police had failed, albeit down the road you could show some major mistakes they'd made, you couldn't clearly say they'd failed to investigate it. The editor felt that wasn't a story. And the producer said to me, you know, we're not going to run anything. And I said, well, that's just mad. I said, you know, that's the story is that he's a sex offender. The fact of whether or not the police failed to do it right or organisations heard something and didn't do anything about it, that is secondary. First of all, he's a sex offender. And that is the story. Well, the first time I come across your work was uh, the, the Jimmy Savile stuff. And it was bizarre to me because like a lot of people who sat at home, he just looks like, I think Frankie Boyle said, if you had to draw a paedophile, it'd be Jimmy Savile. And I watched that Louis through documentary and I thought, it was just weird then. Well, why did it take so long for someone like you to come along and to break that story? Yeah, I mean, I think he was a, certainly a very weird character as an individual. But in a way that probably played to his advantage because people didn't question him. Albeit there were people in all kinds of walks of life, both those that came across him professionally, those that knew him as a, a contact, uh, who had doubts about him. The newspapers had information given to them over the years. They never did anything with it. Uh, in a way, he was very litigious, so he would threaten to sue them. But he would also trade, as many people did, in the same way as Max Clifford did. You know, they would trade stories to keep stories about them out of the press. And that still happens now with high-profile celebrities. Uh, and then... Of course, the news, the, the, not just the newspapers, but radios and televisions had stories about him. They had information about him, but he was untouchable. He became an untouchable person. He was so, so big. If you can think of him in the context of today, imagine there today being only two television channels. He was at the height of one of those. There was in those days, the 70s and 80s, only the BBC and ITV, Channel 5, Channel 4, Sky, and all the other platforms didn't exist. So he was a real celebrity. And as a result of that, he was allowed to do almost whatever he wanted. And in a way that meant that he just didn't get challenged. Is it one of them, like, how, how did it come about that you started investigating him? Was it like through a TV company? Because you'd left the police by then, hadn't you? Yeah, so I'd left the police. I was going, I was doing a report for BBC Newsnight. Uh, I did quite a lot of reports for them. And I was going, uh, just coming back from Interpol, uh, where... I was with my producer in Lyon and we were getting on the plane and whilst we were in the queue of the plane he said to me and I can remember it clearly now he said to me do you know anything about Jimmy Savile being arrested for child abuse and I went no I said no I said he's a weird bloke but no I said I've not I've never heard that at all I said where's that come from he said well there's a lot about it on the internet there's a group on the internet who are from a children's home and, and a number of them are have said that he's abused them although they don't use his direct name they use um uh, an alias or his initials and apparently he was arrested by the police I said well not to my knowledge and I said yeah but I can do some inquiries and look at it and actually it transpires that he'd been arrested by my old police force but at the stage that he'd been arrested I'd left the left the job and so if he had done whilst I'd been there I probably would have dealt with him probably would have been my case I certainly would have known about it but they dealt with him and uh, it matter didn't go any further forward and then BBC Newsnight were looking to do a programme about him being a sex offender. Uh, but their line of the story they wanted from their editor was about failings of the police investigation. And when it became clear that actually the, you couldn't from the outset say that the police had failed, albeit down the road you could show some major mistakes they'd made, you couldn't clearly say they'd failed to investigate it. Uh, the editor felt that wasn't a story. And the producer said to me, you know, we're not going to run anything. And I said, well, that's just mad. I said, you know, that's the story is that he's a sex offender. The fact of whether or not the police failed to do it right or organisations heard something and didn't do anything about it. That is secondary. First of all, he's a sex offender. And that is the story. And so I said, well, would it, can, I, can I run with it? And he said, yeah, you know, you're probably the only person that can get it out there. So I went to ITV and I said to them, look, I've got this. I think it's really big but a lot of work needs to be done on it. You know, the victims need to be established. We need to establish a clear you know, pattern of offending behavior, particularly if we're going to go out into the public domain and, and accuse this man of child sexual abuse. And they said, yeah, let's go with it. Let's run with it. So I set about 
for a period or in total 12 months, but probably for the first six to seven months, trying to find victims, trying to find those people that would give us an account to support or show that actually he was or wasn't a sex offender. So we kind of really came from it from a very impartial point of view. But the point to which we started looking at him, he had already died. And this is really important because had he not have died, we, ITV, would never have been able to broadcast the programme and indeed nobody else would have done. He had to die for a programme to be made about him. Well, is that just for the comeback of it or his lawyers would have been right on it as soon as he got a sniff of it or is that high yeah, profile? he'd have just been so, lit so litigious. He'd have challenged, he'd have, he'd have done everything. He had, you know, had enough money and a backing behind him uh, that he would have fought the whole thing and no broadcaster would have gone up against him. It, it, it's a weird one because I watched that Louis through when he revisited the, when he met him and stuff like that and it, mm. it's just so bizarre isn't it because there's some instances where he's like trying to get changed in front of women and how he presents himself I know you can't like say looking back it's easy but he's a very odd guy and that's on camera I always think if you're really weird on camera what was he like around producers or when he had them kids programs we'll fix it and I stuff like that. like that I mean Louis it was a very strange. So when we started to look at him, we made I made contact with Louis, and I know Louis. But Louis didn't want to engage with us at all, sharing information or, or discuss anything. Um, and in fact, the second Louis program he made, which was a really weird program, was kind of about Louis saying, "I've been duped." Um, I think really, because you know Louis, he's a very astute man, is Louis, but he got completely had by Savile. Uh, and in a strange way, because he kind of, Savile admitted offending to him, admitted being a sex offender, admitted having an interest in children, talked about some of his behaviour. And, and of course, that's, we only saw what made it onto television. Yeah. I'd love to have seen the rushes as to the other things, the rushes in terms of the material that was shot that never got onto screen. I'd love to see those cuts because I suspect they tell another story of Savile that was never told but of course they've never been seen by anybody well i think on that second program they showed you like a few seconds of him talking like candidly at night time or something like that and i thought i bet that happened quite a bit and but it's it, it, not just yeah. louis but it's people in like the bbc when he, he was on them shows like i feel like if i worked obviously not everyone's the same but if i seen a guy being really inappropriate with children I think I'd, I'd be impulsed to go and maybe say this is weird or try and go above my pay grade and say I don't like how he's asking little kids to come and get whatever he was doing because it's bound to have went on. Everyone no, he was allowed to get away been. with it. Yeah, he was absolutely allowed to get away with it because people feared him. You know, there was those that could have done something about it in management who didn't. There were those that sadly couldn't have done anything about it but could have told somebody else. And there's those that were just so fearful they couldn't do anything about it at all. You know, those people that were... Yeah, the amount of people that met him, nurses in particular, you know, people within the production staff at television. You know, there's a lot of stories and people were very uncomfortable with him a lot of the time. But nobody actually did anything about it. And even when they had pretty concrete stuff about him, they still didn't do anything about it. You know, he was allowed to effectively walk on water and get away with whatever he wanted. And I think that's the injustice. You know, yes, I finally managed to expose him and it was incredibly difficult. But that should never have been the case. He should never have been allowed to get away with it for as long as he did and die, you know, without facing justice. It, it, well, obviously, my memory is not that great, but I can remember when that sort of broke. Afterwards, there was a bit of a snowball effect, wasn't there? There was a few more celebrities getting thrown under. And mm. I, I, th I think it was a good thing because a lot more people came out and talked about it. And it was like, well... I think he's a bit odd and he's a bit weird. He done this and stuff like that. Did you did you see that a bit of a snowball effect where people weren't as, as afraid anymore? Oh, yeah, I mean, off the night of the program, I got an email from someone saying, "Do you know Max Clifford?" And, and I said, "Well, I do, but I don't don't know him. I've never worked with him." And she said, uh, "I've got something to tell you." And she did, and she told me about how Max Clifford had abused her. So that set in in place a chain of events when I then spoke to the Metropolitan Police and said there's offences that Max Clifford's committed will you take him on and they said yeah absolutely and obviously then an investigation starts on Clifford and I remember giving an interview for I think it was Good Morning Britain or whatever it was at that stage and 
the he came up after me so i did something and then he came up afterwards talking about something and i remember thinking to myself little do you know in a few months time you're going to get arrested in relation to child abuse and of course he was uh he was a really particularly nasty person there's a lot more yeah. information i knew about uh clifford that's never been out in the public domain i did a you know really detailed research and investigation into him and he's he's a particularly nasty person and then i think you've also got uh rolf harris so of course rolf harris i had a a number of victims come to me who'd been abused by rolf harris so they got passed to the police uh, and then other people you know who some some well-known names and other people who aren't well-known names just members of the public and those all got passed to the authorities i think as a direct result of our program it certainly changed policies attitudes procedures views that the public held around child abuse made it much easier and safer for people to come forward and a great deal of good has come from it we got a letter from the nspcc i think within the weeks after the program saying you know as a direct result of your program over a thousand children young people have been saved from abuse that's fantastic you know it, it it has made such a difference i think the problem with it all as is always the case with any exposure is that it's very difficult for the pendulum to sit in the middle so whilst we exposed him and we got some other people arrested the police sadly then went after some people who they shouldn't have gone after yeah. where there wasn't the sufficient evidence uh, and as a direct result of that, of course, have then muddied the water for the genuine victims out there to have come forward. So it's always very difficult for the pendulum to sit in the middle. What, what, what do you think of these like vigilante type people, you know, like um, to, like uh, to catch a predator? There's like Facebook groups where the, they pretend to be like a young person, lure them there and then it goes on Facebook Live. Like a lot of the general public don't mind that, because, especially if it's done properly in the have been messaging, they're not setting up people I don't like and things like that. What, what, what's your type of opinion on that? So I can see a, see a real value in that. I think that the public have a uh, an added advantage that they can do a lot of good and they can help expose criminals and they can help the police get evidence in relation to uh, offenders. And it would be great if the police had the resources that they were doing all the jobs and work themselves. But we know that's not true. We know there are thousands of online predators out there who are falling through the system because the police don't have the resources to take them on. And therefore then when public do it and they do it right and they, they lure someone to a location who has been grooming a child, I think that's great. The problems come when of course they, they do it in such a way that they uh, allow evidence to be destroyed or they put children at risk or they do it in such a way that it won't stand up in a court of law that's where the problem comes and I've seen a lot of those arrests or those detentions on YouTube and, and other platforms and some of them are very good some of them are terrible and actually I really seriously question the individuals that are doing it you know, in the manner in which they're doing it, they're not necessarily, I think, doing it for the right reasons. It's probably all about them as to why they're doing it. Yeah. And they're causing more harm than good. But I think it's, there has a, there's a real value to them. But sadly, there are people sometimes that do that who get it completely wrong and they don't help. Do you think with the internet, it's made it worse to try and place this, this sort of a subject? Because internet kid most kids now they've got a phone in the run from a very young age they've all got social media and who, who's checking the social media and things like that i don't have kids yet but i i feel like i keep saying if, if i have a little girl she's not going on the internet until she's 16 and stuff like that but realistically you can't stop them can you because at school they get the ipads to do homeworks and things the internet has, has changed the way people offend so there will always be child sex offenders as long as there will be children uh, but of course, the Internet has created a greater opportunity for them. Offending is all about access and opportunity, access to your victim, whether that be directly or indirectly. So in person or online and the opportunity, the opportunity to offend. And of course, the Internet affords far greater opportunity because you can do it in your bedroom. You can do it sat in your car. You can do it on the park bench, you know, on your mobile phone, uh, on your computer. So that opportunity is far greater. It's 24 hours a day now in order to be able to offend. And that is, of course, therefore, then there is a need for supply and demand. 
so that the greater the amount of people who want the material, the greater the need for that material to be produced. And very sadly, children are a commodity. There is a value to a child. I mean, there's a value to a human life, but there's a value to a child's life now as a commodity. And these individuals, the money people behind the back of this will exploit that, exploit the opportunity to be able to make either money out of it or for their own sexual gratification because in terms of the sexual exploitation of children it comes in two forms it comes in a monetary form but it also comes in a sexual gratification form what, what, what advice would you give to a parent that's got like just say they've got young kids and they're going on the internet is there anything you can do i know they have parent blocks and stuff like that but yeah. even when we were younger you could easily get around that at any time you like is it is it anything you could say to them so the best advice I would say to any parent is from an early age, and I'm talking five, six, seven, start engaging with your child and use the internet. The internet is a massive, massive resource. It's part of our life. It's here to stay. You know, those people who turn around and say, teachers and things, you know, just don't let your children on the computer. That's not the reality. You know, we have to allow children to see where the danger comes from in order to prevent the danger from of getting them in a position of danger. So if we know where the threat comes from, then we can deal with it, can't we? So what we have to do is we have to say to children, right, what is it that you're doing on the internet? So if you've got young children, start engaging with them saying the internet does this, these are some of the good sites to go to, these are some of the things that we can do together on the internet. If you've got slightly older children, so you're coming to this a bit later, engage with your children, get your children to tell you what sites they go to, where they're visiting, what they're doing on the internet. Tell them about the risks. Tell them that there are these people who go online who present a danger. And because the Internet sometimes can be anonymous, what it means is that some of those people you talk to aren't who they say they are. So they might tell you they're a 14 year old girl who goes to school down the road. But in reality, they might be a 60 year old man who's got a string of convictions for child abuse or a sexual interest in children. So people can hide their anonymity on the Internet very, very well. So the biggest thing I would say to parents is, is talk to your children and learn what the Internet is about. Tell them where the risks come from and work through with them how they deal with those risks as and when they occur and be very open. Have open conversations with children about what their fears, what their concerns are, what's going on at school, what's going on around it. The more open you are, the easier it is to prevent offences from happening or issues from coming. But also, crucially, it will mean your children will talk to you when something has happened. That's good advice. That's what I mean. Like, it, it, like you said, you can't just stop them going on the internet, can you? You've just got to sort of educate them as you go along. Otherwise, you, you'll just you have that like sort of... Um, cross between where you'll just say like don't go on the internet at all then they'll go on it without the guidance and stuff like that and they'll probably get themselves into more trouble absolutely and i'd say to many parents you know go and learn about the internet you know, there's lots of you know generation my generation particularly all those older than me you know they won't have the skills of the internet like the younger generation have you know your generation and, and younger because they've been brought up with it whereas the internet came in whilst we were kind of coming to our latter ages of you know 20 really i mean when i joined the police service the internet really was in its infancy in terms of its use and how it was used now of course it's, it's everywhere you know mobile phones i remember the first mobile phones we had you know now you say to young people about getting a mobile phone and it's almost a you know it's a it's a given you know they'll have a mobile phone when they get to a certain age well yeah we didn't have mobile phones at all uh, so the whole process in terms of technology has changed and what we have to do as adults as parents is learn and learn as quickly as possible and we can do that ourselves but we can also do that through our children and in, and ensure that we have those open communication i mean another tip i always give to parents is when you go to bed at night turn the internet off because it prevents your children unless of course they're using uh, 3g uh, um, through their provider but it will it will limit the amount that your children will be able to go online who's the worst person you've came across with your work from a policeman to now doing the investigation who's the one that you you just like sends a shudder down your spine which one just disgusted you the most well i think they all do in a way you know every offender in a way disgusts me because of what they've done you know there is the um Tia Sharp's murder and Stuart Hazel, 
you know, when Stuart Hazel murdered Tia Sharp, horrific. And of course, I sat down and interviewed him prior to him going on the run and being arrested, you know, serving 38 years in jail. Horrific offences, what he did to her. And the totality of what he's, he did to her has never come out, really. So he discussed me. I did a major investigation for my Netflix series on um, Angus Sinclair and Peter Tobin. And both of those, you know, huge serial killers, probably Angus Sinclair, the biggest serial killer, I think, that as as far as operating and has got away with his crimes, killed many, many more people. But Peter Tobin, you know, probably killed another two or three. I don't think he's killed nowhere near as many as Angus Sinclair. But Peter Tobin is probably the most vile man that I've ever had any dealings with. I haven't directly dealt with him. He was in jail. But vile man, absolutely brutal, didn't care, just horrible, horrible man. You know, he's still alive in jail and, you know, he won't be for this world much longer. And he's taken all he'll take all the secrets away with him. And then you've got uh, other people. I mean, there's a guy that I met uh, in I, I did an investigation in um, India, in Srinagar. And this young girl, Sarah Graves, had been murdered. And the individual who had murdered her is on trial now. I met him and sat down with him, spoke with him, also went to jail and saw him in jail. And he was denying the offences. But he, you know, he brutally stabbed her in excess of 50 times. He was very sexually motivated. Uh, and he just talked to me in a calm, calm way. I mean, I think the most of the offenders I've met, and I've met a lot of offenders over the over my years, both in terms of police, in terms of investigations I do now, um, they, most of them don't, with the exception of Peter Tobin, I think you'd probably an exception to that, they're normal, they're your next door neighbour. You know, Peter Sutcliffe, the brutal offences he committed, he was no different than your neighbour. You know, he was your friend, he was, you'd meet him down the pub, or he'd he dropped, you know, dropped his shopping off. He's that type of person. He was just a normal person. And that is why they get away with it. So most serious offenders are just normal people, what we would call normal. Well, that's a bit with like the Ted Bundys of all people that people know, like the Ted Bundy, Chris Watts. Like if you've seen Chris Watts, when even at the start, I watched that documentary, I didn't really know the background of it. I just thought, I wonder what happened to his family. It, it didn't dawn on me until he went to the next door neighbour. I thought, is, is, it, is he going to be the guy that did it? Do you know what I mean? Like, And he's so normally picking kids. That's up the, the Netflix, the, the, the murder of the family next door or something. That's yeah. that one. Is that one? Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's an amazing programme. I have to say, out of all of my you know, programmes I've watched, and I watch a lot of programmes given my work, um, I thought it was exceptional, really good, you know, great material and him as an individual. I mean, talk, talk about, you know, a psychopath. He was a psychopath, you know, to be able to do that and then carry that on in a way because actually you're watching it. I mean, as I watched it and obviously I knew the backstory, I watched it. I'm thinking, really, is he, is this really the man? Yeah. And of course yeah. you knew, you knew it was him, you're th but he came across so genuine you know that's why it's quite funny when you look at some of these programs sometimes you know there's a, a program called faking it i think it is where they go back and look at people who've committed crimes and say you know these are clear these are the indicators they committed the crimes you know i, I think it's very interesting you know those it's very easy in hindsight to look back and go well yeah when he twitched his eye or when he moved his head that way that you know that's clearly him lying the problem is is the majority of these people are clearly you know, very good liars, and they are. You know, when Stuart Hazel sat in front of me and lied, you know, I knew he had to be lying because what his story meant that he had to be the killer. He was the last person to see her. No one else has seen her after, and there is no evidence to support that she's still alive. So it had to be him. But there's no way as you sit and watch, to watch that interview. I remember coming out of there and after go, do you know what? Brilliant. He's, a, you know, he's, a, he's lied to me. I know he's lied to me, but he's believable he's very very believable and he was well like you, you sometimes get them body experts especially on them american programs like if you itch your ear with your right hand that means you're a murder and you you feel like they're, right. they're sometimes just jumping at stuff aren't they just uh, especially in hindsight it's very easy, easy to in hindsight back. isn't it you know once somebody's been convicted it's very easy to come along and go yeah well because he did that i knew he was a killer oh yeah brilliant so you're great now well, how many how many cases have you solved by coming in early and doing that yeah zero okay 
the one guy you did meet and no one else got the interview was Oster Pistorius. And that's yeah. a lot of people's opinion because he was a hero, wasn't he? He was an icon in, yeah. well, in the world and especially in South Africa. I, having reviewed the case and things like that, do you, do you believe the official story that went on? So, I mean, Oscar, I got to know really well. I would count Oscar as a friend. <coughs> um, and I think that he, you know, he was made a, a martyr of the South African system, no doubt about that. You know, three biggest celebrities in South Africa, him, uh, Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela. You know, those are the three status individuals. That's how high he was. And certainly on that night, there was no evidence to support an argument had taken place. He was still very much in love. It was very much early days for him and for Reva. And on that night, I genuinely believe he felt that there was a intruder in the house. And as a result of that, he woke up in the middle of the night, heard the noise, took his gum and responded without thinking. You know, it's those people who turn around and say, yeah, but why didn't he check she was in bed? Well, why would he? You know, she would he would have thought she was in bed. And don't forget, you're reacting at a split second. So you're having to make a decision in a split second to protect the person who is in bed with you because he thinks an intruder is in the house. And you've also got to understand of how common house evasions are in South Africa. They are very, very common. And there are every year there will be people in South Africa, residents who will kill invaders. Who, intruders who've come into their house they'll shot them because of course they are allowed to have firearms in South Africa so it's a very regular occurrence and people get shot quite regularly um, which is really sad you know the the South African system decided to make a martyr of uh, Oscar which is which is very sad for him and of course you know not for one minute it does do I or indeed Oscar looked to minimize what he's done. He killed Reva Steenkamp and, you know, in his, and he took a life. And for that, he will have to live with for the rest of his life. And he should duly be punished for that. But only for that, you know, these stories that he was domestic violence, these stories that he was a wife beater, there's no evidence to support that. And indeed the judge, Masipa, at the trial very clearly said, there is no evidence to support that. But it's one of them that split opinion, isn't it? I think a lot of people, I think I think because it's a different country, isn't it, South Africa to England, so it, it'd be weird for if people I heard a noise. Relate, they can't relate to it. No. That, that, that's they what I mean. To it. But it, it does happen, then, house invasions. South Africa is a very different place than the UK, so I can see the angle of, like, like say if there's a, someone in your house, you don't think twice, you don't ask them what they're doing or anything like that, and it's maybe you or them at the time. Mm. Absolutely. And I think it's, you know, it does divide people, you know, whenever I do any talks or anything like that, Oscar's always one of the conversations I talk about is in my book. Uh, and, you know, I'm very supportive of Oscar, but I, you know, compared to everybody else, I've been to South Africa, I've spent a lot of time in South Africa, Johannesburg, Pretoria, and, and I know how it works around there. And I've looked at, you know, I've spoken to Oscar many, many times, and I've given him a hard time, you know, in terms of digging into his story. So the reality is, is that as far as being informed, you know, I am informed. I've had that compared to all those other people out there. And it's not a matter of being hoodwinked. You know, people don't hoodwink me. I, you know, I make a decision in terms of the evidence and where the evidence is. And the evidence does not support domestic violence. The evidence does not support that he's a wife beater. All the evidence supports that he was deeply in love. And what's really sad is that the problem is, is the police put so many false, in, false stories out into the press within the first few days weeks and months that were never corrected by the family they should have been but they were never corrected by the family and therefore that information then stayed and formed the basis of members of the public having an opinion for example he killed her she was pregnant she wasn't pregnant right you know that was a right, big headline yeah. in the newspaper oscar was on steroids he wasn't on steroids at all he was on herbal medicine which is entirely legal in his in the uh, athletics world but that was what the press put out there. And of course, you've then suddenly got a different narrative that's being put to you. And it's very difficult once you've got a, the, sow, the seed has been sowed as far as one narrative, it's very difficult to get the public to then change their mind and go with something else. Well, that's what the media do, don't they? It's like, uh, I, I can remember that myself saying, it might have been a road rage. 
uh, they were having trouble and stuff like that. So it's sort of planting that seed as if the public are the jury, isn't it, really? They just said, oh, well, this is what happened. This is what could have happened. And when it comes up to this thing, you're like, definitely guilty. No one's heard any evidence or anything like that. But a few little stories like that just changes everyone's opinion. And, of course, the problem with our British press, I mean, the British press are fairer than than most of the press around the world, but even ours, our press, you know, we are, press is very biased. You know, if a, if a newspaper wants to write a story in a certain way, they will. You know, they have their own agendas, they have their own process in terms of how they want to spin something. So sadly, even though, you know, we have the best and most independent press in the world, it is very biased at times. The, the other story I wanted to know about was we, we watched, like, obviously it's dramatised, the, the White House murders. And that's a case, it was before my time, mm. with Jeremy Bamber. What, what's your view on that? Because that, if you watch the drama and you watch a few documentaries, it's sort of sealed, definitely Jeremy done it. Do, do, you, do you go along with that story? No. No, so, I mean, Jeremy, I've known Jeremy for quite a number of years now, five, six, seven years. I've made a programme about Jeremy... And I write to him quite regularly. And he writes to me actually two days ago. I think I've got a letter from Jeremy. Um, he's innocent. He's absolutely innocent. There is no doubt that the evidence against him, if presented in a court of law today, would mean he was found innocent. The senior investigating officers were very clear that it was a murder-suicide. Sheila Caffell killed herself. Sorry, killed her parents, her children, and then killed herself. She was the only person in there that had... Uh, uh, drug habit and she talked about killing her children in the months previously she was uh, under psychiatrist because of her mental health Jeremy had none of that you know Jeremy had nothing to gain from doing that he had nothing to gain financially from the house and he certainly had nothing to gain from killing them and he had no mental health illnesses yet Sheila did and the way that those crimes were committed would have required somebody to have completely lost it she had that capacity, you know, in the days and the weeks prior to the murders, she was she was not getting out of bed. She was wandering around in a dressing gown. She was carrying a Bible around with her, talking through in talking out verses of the Bible. The family were really worried about her. In fact, she had she had had a stay um, in a hospital, in a mental hospital in, in the in the week, in the months prior to the murders. Jeremy had had none of that. And the, author the authorities absolutely believed it was Sheila Caffell until it suddenly switched when a new investigating officer came in because the investigating officer that was, a, was on it died, sadly fell off a ladder and died, that this new officer then changed the whole tack and then went after a, a fictitious story that had been made up by his girlfriend at the time who said that you know it was organised, him and a pl local plumber did it. Well, they tracked the local plumber down. He said, I don't know what you're talking about. Absolutely not. Yet they still kept with the same story that uh, um, Jeremy had done it. I mean, one of the reasons that is always portrayed as being the truth, the, the reason he did it is because he was happy and jolly and he was smiling. He went to the, the funeral smiling. Well, that just shows an absolute ignorance and lack of how people respond to, 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 you know, to loss and grief. Some people respond to loss and grief in a manner that they don't change or they become you know, jolly or happy or they, they, some people go really quiet. It affects, grief affects people in so many different ways, but you know, very clearly Jeremy didn't commit that. Now the chances of Jeremy getting out, he's got a, a campaign at the moment to try and he's got papers sitting with the criminal case review to see if they will give him an appeal. Um, I hope he gets it. I think the chances are very, very slim, but I do hope he gets it. But yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, I don't don't say things without proper evidence to support. And compared to those other people who've looked at things, I can tell you I've looked at it in real detail. He's not guilty. Sheila Caffell killed, sadly, her parents, her children, and then shot herself. That's the bit when I watched it, because what they try and do with these dramas is make him have shady eyes. He was partying the week after and things like that. And that's what we said. We said, it just seems a jump, doesn't it, from a normal guy doing normal things, no problems with his family, then shoots two kids and his parents. It's like a, a leap, isn't it? You know what I mean? He's gone from like a normal day guy to a Ted Bundy in the space of like an hour. But why? Yeah, that's, uh, that's what we why? were saying. There's no motive. No, it's, it's... No motive. No motive. I mean, the motive they gave was a financial return from it. But that's not true because had they all of, I mean, his parents were going to die anyway, fairly soon. 
and um, he'd have got the farm. Yeah, you know, he was anyone working the farm, he'd have got the farm, and he'd have carried on. So, you know, how how killing them does that help in any way at all? His, his sister had serious mental health issues. How, how does he keep his spirits up in jail for something like that? I couldn't imagine going to jail like this oh, lockdown. You, you're bound to get to, isn't it? I, I don't know. I don't know how he keeps going, but he does. You know, I remember one of the letters I wrote to him in the early days, and I remember saying to him, you know, how do you keep positive? And he does. You know, his letters are so positive. I've never read letters from somebody who's who's in jail, and I write to, you know, there's a few people in jail that write to me, who remain so positive. Incredible. Really incredible after all those years. The, the, the last one I wanted to talk about, just because I've just watched it on Netflix, was The Night Stalker, because they had the Cecile Hotel, mm. and he used to go in, apparently, blood on his clothes, walk through. If you looked at that guy in the street, you'd think there's some up with him. When, you know what I mean? Like, he's such a recognisable person with them teeth and the way he looked. Why did it take so long to catch someone like that? Is that just... Because it seemed like the police were just focusing on the trainer and things. Would, would it not have been better putting... I don't know, a different tactic out. Well, I think, I mean, one of the major problems, there were so many victims and, and they struggled, of course, I think, to manage them and they were in different areas, different different officers were investigating them. Uh, and I think that's often a case with, certainly in America, more so than the UK, because obviously it's much bigger in America and they are much more split in terms of police um, you know, structures over there, lots of local before it becomes, you know, a, a, um, a national police issue through an FBI. And so I think that you've got issues of transferring information, communication, talking to each other. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they should have caught him a lot earlier, I think. I mean, that Cecil Hotel, I remember watching, I mean, I watched Cecil Hotel on Netflix uh, and I wasn't very impressed with it because actually I, I completely felt duped the, yeah, they made such a massive issue about this ghost in the lift when the reality was it was just a timing issue on the button and it's like you know you held that for two parts before you then tell me actually there's a timing button timing issue it's like well, it's just ridiculous um but what a fascinating place i mean the story about cecil hotel was was the story of the hotel i think they missed the missed the point because they went after this one person who was clearly in the tank from the day she went missing yeah. I mean, you know, when I thought it was very interesting when they interviewed the police officer and the police officer goes, there's no way she could have got out of this place. Absolutely no way. She must have been here the whole time. Uh, you know, there's no way. And I'm thinking, yes, yeah, she was. She was in a tank. But of course, you don't say. And the question that should have been asked is, well, did you check the tank? And of course, he never he's never asked that. So we never know whether he checked the tank. But he clearly didn't because she would have been in there. You know, she wasn't hanging around that hotel afterwards. That night, I'm sure she ended up in the tank. However that was, you know, whether she was murdered and thrown in there or whether she decided to, to climb in under, under some kind of drug-induced hallucination or whatever, which is possible. But that Cecil Hotel, what a fantastic place. I mean, I, I just think some of the stories and the things that must have gone on at that place... Um, and I thought that the, the hotel manager, I mean, what, a, what an interesting, strange character she was. You know, she wanted to give her interview on the camera to set straight that the Cecil Hotel was OK. And every time she opened her mouth, I thought, what are you, what are you talking about? You, you're just talking about how bad the Cecil Hotel is and about how you allowed things to go on and how crime was being committed there and how murders were being committed there and how everything was being committed there. And it was okay. And you just like, it was okay. But now you're coming to defend it. It's like, whoa. Yeah, I thought that. She she didn't really give it much like, the, like, is there many murders there? Yeah, we have murders each day. As if like, that was just like putting the quilts on the beds or something like that. And like, did some of the rooms set fire? Right. Yeah, they set fire. Yeah, yeah. And it stunk the hotel, smelled quite a bit. And you're like, are you defending this? Or like, I felt like you can't still work there or have any allegiance to that place. Because I was like, you're fucked. She's not exactly bigging that place up. Well, she was got, she'd gone on it to defend it and then ended up sitting there going, yeah, that happened and that happened and that happened. Right. OK, so so are we call, we should be calling you into question. I mean, this is the problem with those director led films rather than someone who's an investigator is actually because I would have said to her, listen, what are you doing here? You are you supporting the hotel or are you telling me that the hotel is a terrible place? In which case, why did you work here for so long? Why didn't you do something about it? 
How did you allow this to happen? Well, it, it, it's weird with these programmes now. Crime's huge, isn't it? Everyone wants to be doing your job now. So your job's probably the most populous job in the UK because a new crime documentary goes on and everyone just sits on the sofa and they're, they're, they're analysing it, aren't they? Like you sat there thinking, oh, God, I can't believe there's left fingerprints there. And you're trying to piece it together yourself. Yeah. So your job's People become like a celebrity object, job. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I mean. Like, I, I watch that. People love to be the Yeah, yeah. That Cecil Hotel, they kept playing that lift clip, and I thought that just looks like a poor woman that's took drugs or she's a loose name, she's going in and out the lift. And I was a bit like you, I feel like they could have crammed it maybe into two episodes. It just seems like she just went upstairs and well, we were completely conned in the lift. We were completely conned on the lift. We were we were trying to be told that there was something suspicious, someone hanging around the corner or some kind of ghost or whatever. The reality was is there was a timer delay on the lift button. Ridiculous. You know, it's, but you see, the problem with some of these television programs, like the likes of that on British television, Cecil Hotel would never have gotten a terrestrial television in the form that it was, because no lawyer would have allowed you to tell the story in the way that they told the story. Same as making a murderer. You know, there's no impartiality in making a murder. It was completely one sided without any balance and response from the other side. So you'll see the way television programs are made depends on the platform that they're on. So you'll have for example um you know netflix amazon who will who will put a program out in a certain way and then you'll have the likes of itv bbc channel five who will put a program out in a very different way because you can't you have to be much fairer in terms of the platforms you know uh, amazon and certainly netflix you know are not subject to the same ofcom rules as itv bbc channel four channel five are so they have to. So their program will be very different, and that does mean that sometimes you're given a pro, you're given a, a steer to which the way the broadcaster or the platform wants you to see that program, and that was certainly the case in relation to making a murderer. I mean, I do I think that, and I can't remember the guy, the, the people's names. I think that the cousin or the nephew was clearly innocent. Yeah. But the man that was convicted, I have to say, I think the evidence is, I think he was probably guilty. I don't think he's an innocent man at all. You know, how do you have in your in the grounds of your uh, estate, not far from where you live, the bones of the victim? Explain that one who'd been burnt, yet you know nothing about it. No, nah, not buying that. Well, that, that was a problem, wasn't it? He was the last person she'd seen and stuff like that. And the evidence, I don't I, like, I'm like you, the cousin, he, he didn't know what day of the week it was, was he? He just sat there and after, after he said, yeah, yeah, he killed him. They basically put the words in his mouth. He said, can I go back to school, wasn't he? That's how clued up that lad was. I mean, totally, ter terrible interviewing. Yeah, poor lad. He should never have been convicted. But the other guy, yeah, I think he's, he's as guilty as sin. They may not have had all the evidence against him. Um, and maybe shouldn't have been convicted on the base of the evidence they had. But is he guilty? Yeah. Well, it, it, the, the same one in the UK was Karen Matthews. I always felt like there must have been someone helping Karen because when she started doing the interviews, I thought she, she doesn't seem like, you wouldn't want her in your quiz team, would you? Sort of thing. She just doesn't seem that, that, that switched on. And I felt like she wouldn't be able to put it together or at least get away with it for a month. Well, yeah, it's very bizarre. I mean, I covered the Karen Matthews story. I went up there and covered it. And I remember arriving in Dewsbury on two days or so after Karen had, uh, Shannon had gone missing. Uh, and I remember walking along the street and it was a cold night. And there must have been, I don't know, 10, 11 women, all with bare feet and dressing gowns walking around the streets. Uh, and it was about seven or eight o'clock at night. And I was remember thinking... Mm, the, the, I mean, there was there was a different kind of society's element of the location of where she went missing from. Uh, obviously, didn't go missing, but uh, I mean, Karen Matthews was she she got consumed obviously by this story they'd made up, and then and then ran with it, and in a way was kind of helped because the community rallied around her and supported her, and as a result of that it allowed her story to continue and go on and on and on. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it, when poor Shannon was found under the bed 
uh, or hiding, you know, and, and she'd been tied to the rope to the loft, which was just enough wire so she could go to the toilet. I mean, the most incredible thing about that, and I remember the day she was found, I was in Sky covering it literally as it was developing. And I remember thinking, and, and I've said many times since, how on earth did she think she was going to get away with it? Did she think that one day she was just going to, you know, Shannon was suddenly going to pop up and appear and, and tell everybody, oh, it's got nothing to do with my mum. She's got nothing to do with it. I mean, I, how, what, where did she ever think what the end result was going to be? How was she going to get out of this? Mad. But I remember one story. I mean, it, that she, she went, she was given um, the local uh, shop, supermarket said look you're obviously a big story you've not got much money we really want to help so they said to her listen here's a here's a shopping trolley fill it with whatever you want and you can have it and she went round. she popped a telly in there and uh, and a few other you know high priced electrical items nothing about clothes or food for her children and that just kind of showed that mindset of what she was about uh, well, that, I was like you, like, I, I just don't see what the long term plan was. She opened to like get the ransom, give it to her uncle. He just comes back. He's got a new car. And he's Sharon. She's not going to talk about the past. And it just it, it seemed like it yeah. must have been impulsive or something. Or, I, But she's out free now, isn't she? I, I, I well, would, this is the problem with a lot of people. They don't, always, they don't always think the end result, do they? You know, they, they spur the moment, right, do this and do that. And they might have thought it through to a degree but actually they didn't think of all the permutations of what could happen. But, you know, lots of people don't, you know, when you, you know, somebody might be fixing a drawer or changing something or, or doing something, the amount of times I watch people doing something and I think, you know, you're just, an accident's just about to happen because you haven't thought about what's going to happen beyond that. You know, I'm very much, when I do something, I always think of what could go wrong and what could happen. Whereas it's amazing the amount of people who don't do that and you watch them and you think, God, oh, why are you doing it like that? No, but uh, anyways, Mark, I've took up enough of your time. It's been, uh, I'm, I'm one of them. I'm, I'm a bit of a fan, so I can just, I, I could talk about it, I'd say, for the next three weeks. So, But uh, cheers for coming on. No, it's a pleasure. And uh, you look after yourself and take care.